I think the question is, you, you, you know, you flick any document, you go to the website and you search about Singapore University, they'll tell you we have autonomous university. Our question is, are they really autonomous? Uh, you will find, you know, and this is the theme throughout, you, you, you know, education in Singapore. Even at the university level, the key thing is that uh, it's an economic tool. In fact, the whole education project is, uh, the aim is to bring in 150,000 international students by 2015. The number was 80,000 in 2006. So just in the space of nine years, the plan was to double up. Although they have announced recently that this number is uh, put on hold or deferred indefinitely, we are not clear yet. Uh, school rankings, well, we have university rankings. Uh, there's a severe obsession uh, with uh, university rankings. Uh, you would have read in the media recently uh, about rankings. Even at tertiary level, the obsession with exam examination still continues. And one of the key issue is uh, placing a limit on the number of uh, 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 local graduates. So I want to elaborate uh, point A and uh, connect it to point E. So we are autonomous. But at the same time, you know, we have information that the real agenda in terms of university enrollment in Singapore is to be capped at 20 to 25 percent only. All right, this was from a WikiLeaks uh, document which is now uh, widely available uh, publicly, online. And there is a thinking among the elite, the TAP elite. Lee Kuan Yew felt that uh, if we had too many graduates, it may result in them being unemployed, roaming the street and planning revolutions. So. We better not have too, too many graduates there. Yeah? But even as recently as last year, 2013, uh, Minister for National Development, Kuo Bun Huang, said, can we as a whole country have 100% of graduates? Uh, the point is, um, for, 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 for him, uh, even if you have a degree, you don't have a job, uh, what is the use? And the question is, why aren't our graduates, local graduates, having jobs? So you can see we talk about autonomy, the university, but at the same time, universities, they have an agenda to cap the graduates at 20 to 25%. And, and I just wanted to make that point and, 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 and link that up. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on academic freedom in a little bit, but I want to just show you some numbers. And I think this is the uh, disturbing trend. Uh, this is uh, from UNESCO. So you will see in terms of uh, flow of tertiary students, uh, just taking the last few years, so you have a sense of uh, the current numbers. We have Singaporean students leaving Singapore, going out to study. And that in itself is a challenge. You know, first they're pushed down because they can't get enough places. And again, I want you to think about the, the claim that universities are autonomous and the cap and the reasons behind the cap. So our students are pushed out and going out to study is not cheap. And then they go out, they come back with their degrees and many find difficulties in securing employment in a very, very crowded marketplace. But at the same time, you will see the number of incoming students into our tertiary institutions, it's more than double. It's about 50% ballpark. Uh, 50,000 ballpark over the last few years. Adding more pressure to the limited space and it becomes complicated when quite a lot of these students 
receive grants and scholarships, foreign students. So it sort of you know inflates the problem even more. So so that kind of numbers <coughs> and the thinking and the structure of what kind of percentage of graduates we want among Singaporeans, you will see that many of the majority of the international students are on a tuition grant. Many of them can also avail themselves to scholarships, scholarships which are not open to Singaporeans, some of them. Some scholarship is open for all, so Singaporeans will have to compete with foreign students, but some scholarships are only open to foreign students because of you know who grants them and what are the criteria and so on. So you have a situation in comparison, students not only Singaporean students not only have a problem, you know, accessing the limited number of places in our tertiary institutions but also they have to pay high tuition fees to study. So many of them have to moonlight, giving tuition, working part-time, all part of the struggle of uh, Singaporean students. Uh, so, so this is the kind of impact, so the numbers are there. Another couple of points. I think it's important to ask why are we spending that amount of taxpayers' money on foreign students' grants and scholarship? And you know, what can we do uh, to remedy this situation? In addition, so again, you know, if you, if you vaguely remember the numbers, 20,000 Singaporean students going out, 50,000 coming in, and then you have that cap of 20-25% uh, of places for universities. Uh, and you have uh, foreign students getting a disproportionate number of grants, but they also sign a bond requiring them to stay back in Singapore and work because they got the grant. So the, pro the, the problem becomes more complicated because not only the numbers are large, but then they stay back and they compete. Right, so, so it increased problems for students already studying here and also our students to go out and come back. <coughs> Another issue is with foreign academics. <coughs> I mean, if you went to Malaysia, and you went to a public university in Malaysia, you know it's a Malaysian university. Okay, let's let's not look at Malaysia. Let's go a bit further. Let's go to Thailand. You'll all also get a sense that it's a Thai university. They all have mechanisms uh, to have international staff. But I think if you come to Singapore, um, the ratio is very very uh, different because the the number of local academics to foreign ones is quite low. And this is again public information available. Uh, I, I, I think I have some, some figures from just I think the uh, NUS and NTU. Uh, I'll just throw them up uh, if you have not seen it. Out of 25 faculty in the political science department in NUS, only seven are Singaporean. Uh, in the Lee Kuan Yew School of Government, out of 82 faculty, uh, less than half are Singaporean, 38 locals. Uh, in the N at NTU, at the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies, out of 21, 29, <coughs> less than half, 12 only are locals. In the Communications Department at NTU, uh, I think uh, the total faculty is 48, uh, Singaporean is uh, 21, and I think this figure is uh, data. So those of you who are reading the news, probably you'll have minus one more. <laughs> so, so you, you you see the 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 ratio is uh, is really of concern. So not only we have a problem from the perspective of foreign students, but also uh, 
uh, for now. now these are information that we have culled uh, from public sources, media reports, parliamentary discussions uh, that sitting academics, sitting, uh, you know, uh, Singaporean academics have raised this, that foreign academics hire and promote scholars they know from their home country or institution. So there's certainly that feeling, right? And again, this information is in public domain and is referenced in the report and the report will be released after. Um, and the reason why they want uh, foreign academics, not just the academics, but also they want their research and, and uh, the citation metric, metric because it boosts their, it's a shortcut, right? To boost their rating. Uh, and this, of course, uh, produces uh, uh, problems for local faculty in terms of employment because uh, I graduated uh, from NUS, from that same political science department, but I haven't worked in any Singapore tertiary institutions <coughs> yet, anyway. So, creates a lot of problems for us, you know, wanting to. Uh, lock on doors because the competition is tight, you know what I mean? And, and, and even uh, when, you, when you apply, you know, your challenges such as those listed uh, uh, in point B. Uh, just to kind of sum up, uh, I'll just briefly uh, take you through uh, our key recommendation on how we can uh, resolve this. One, our first recommendation is to democratize university management and give academics a greater role. And here, the issue of autonomy. I flagged you, you know, that if you flag any major document of a tertiary institution in Singapore, you know, you'll, you, you'll hear the word autonomous. And then I threw out the idea of the cap on the number of percentage of graduates we want. That's just one example, and I think if we really want to be autonomous, and that's our recommendation here, I think we need to amend the Education Act, not only with regards to these things, but also to make the university a free place for students, where students can you know, uh, participate in political activities without the state or the Ministry of Education having a say uh, in how the university involved. Uh, another issue within the same recommendation is that we would like the academics, the sitting faculty, to play a more active role in the management of the universities. You, you will find a trend both in Singapore and, and abroad where administrators uh, play a central role and uh, we want to kind of bring the academics back. In many places, the appointment of senior positions such as faculty sections, deans and so on are elected among their peers. Uh, in Thai public universities, that is the way. So we are also uh, recommending this as part of our first recommendation. Again, to remind you of the number of students leaving and coming in, 20 and 50,000 per year. Uh, Many of the majority of them, uh, you know, availing themselves of the tuition grant scheme, uh, we would like to abolish the tuition grant scheme. Uh, point C, we want to introduce interest-free student loans for all Singaporean students. Here, what we are suggesting, and this is uh, not unique, it, uh, there are different forms of this uh, the UK to Australia, New Zealand. Uh, our proposal here is the interest fee loan will be limited only to the fees uh, and students will have an eight year period uh, after graduation uh, to pay them 25% uh, for every two years. So in the first two years, 25%, third and fourth year, the other 50, 75, and the full 100. <coughs> Um, this will also be available for students studying overseas as well uh, at approved universities and for students uh, taking graduate uh, programs 
uh, there may be option to calibrate in uh, some portion of living expenses as well as part of uh, this tuition, uh, tuition uh, uh, interest-free student loan. <coughs> Train and nurture local academics. We used to have such a system. If you look, if I can pull back the number from the political science department, 25, seven locals. The few locals and, and many and several others in you know the Lee Kuan Yew School of Government and, and RSIS and NTU. Many of the locals are there because they all came on board on a previous senior tutorship scheme. Those days when you graduate uh, with your honors degree uh, uh, and if you wanted to pursue a university career, the department or the university will give out scholarships for you to do an advanced degree, uh, a PhD usually, in an area the university or the department needs, and then you come back, you know, and, and you contribute and you work in the department. Such schemes is the way universities, again, you know, I'll just pull two from our neighboring uh, countries, Malaysia and Thailand, do so, they provide. So, okay, we need a specialist in African studies and this is something the department doesn't have. Okay, then, you know, we will design a scholarship program where, you know, one of our own will go out, undertake research, build some competency and come back. So, and I think, um, this is what we mean by point, point D, to train and nurture own local talent. This does not mean that uh, we don't hire foreigners. Uh, there are uh, areas where we will need expertise. Uh, Australia also uh, does that. It hires foreign academics, provided that department or school needs a faculty where they can't find an Australian or they don't have a skill set. And then, you know, he or she is hired, they are provided, you know, residence permit or a, an employment visa, so on and so forth. So I think, uh, to kind of sum up this section, I think you, we can see from, you know, from early education, primary, secondary school, that some themes continue to, you know, push through right up to tertiary education. And in terms of foreign students, as well as foreign academics, I think the situation has kind of blown out of proportion. All, all we are saying is uh, we need some kind of collaboration and, and common sense uh, to bring things uh, on an even keel. What's happening uh, at the university, you know, it's a kind of a microcosm of society, think that we are experiencing in Singapore as a whole. So I'll end here. Thank you very much.